He is an American cultural icon, a musician, an author, a politician, a cowboy, and an outspoken critic of the Washington establishment. Churchill during the war would stamp memos, inner office memos, action this day, exclamation point. Well, let's not just pick on the Democrats, all these damn politicians. None of them know what action this day means. Coming up, Kinky Friedman on what's right and wrong with America. For this edition of Conversation With, we have traveled deep into the heart of South Texas to the city of San Antonio, home of the Alamo, where you can find a true American original. Just listen to his biography. He is America's most famous Jewish cowboy, a country and western singer who studied psychology, worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in Indonesia, then returned to Texas to become a journalist. Back in the 1970s, the National Organization for Women branded him Male Chauvinist Pig of the Year. But in the intervening years, he has embraced a host of causes, some of them progressive. And today he has fans from across the political spectrum. He counts among his personal friends former U.S. Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. So strap yourselves in and welcome to the truly extraordinary world of Kinky Friedman. This is the earliest I've ever done an interview. Well, I appreciate, in the morning. I appreciate you getting up early to do it. It's a tragic mistake. <laughs> you have been called many things, cowboy, yes. philosopher, musician, writer, politician. Which of those definitions matters most to you, or is it impossible to separate them out from one another? Now, I think of myself as a defender of strays more, um, since my only friends now are uh, stray dogs and old carriage horses. Um, of course, friendship is always overrated anyway. I've noticed that when I run for political office, I have millions of friends. And uh, if I lose, I don't have so many. I've never interviewed anyone quite like Kinky Friedman before. In equal measure, funny, satirical, laconic, controversial and unpredictable. But what do you expect from a man who first won fame by leading a band called Kinky Friedman and the Texas Jew Boys? With its anti-racist anthem, they ain't making Jews like Jesus anymore. His story began in Chicago in 1944, but when he was eight, his parents uprooted the family to the Texas Hill Country, where Kinky Friedman was to become a cowboy. What do you think they were looking for when they came here? Uh, they wanted to start a camp for kids, uh, which would be a mostly Jewish camp, but not, you know, religiously Jewish, but uh, culturally Jewish, maybe, uh, maybe spiritually Jewish. And they did, and they set it up right here. This is 500 acres. They called it Echo Hill Ranch. This was 1952. The camp uh, ran, still runs. My brother runs it, so that's been 60 years. And I was going to ask you about your Jewish upbringing. Were you raised with faith? You spoke about the camp being culturally Jewish, but within the family, was faith important? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was bar mitzvah in Houston and uh, went to Hebrew school and so forth, repressed Hebrew lessons. Uh, so I was raised as a Jew in Texas, even though People on the East Coast don't think that's possible. Well, and how does that work, being a Jew in Texas, particularly being a Jew in the middle of this part of the beautiful Texas country? Well, uh, well, it's easy, and it's, it's a good thing to grow up in a minority. It always is, I think. Um, it makes a different kind of person to be on the outside looking in. That's where Jews traditionally have been. It's all, it also makes a good uh, artist or author uh, to be on the outside looking in. I kind of always like to uh, reference uh, Lieutenant Columbo from television, Peter Falk. Uh, Peter Falk was, he could never be a part of the country club, but he could watch them and see what they do. And he felt very awkward there and very unwelcome. But uh, he had a better view, really, of it from the outside looking in. At what point did you, do you remember 
becoming politically awakened? Was it a politic? Were there political discussions around the dinner table as a kid? What was it that sort sure. of inspired you politically to wake when up I, and look When around? I was seven years old, I actively campaigned for Adlai Stevenson. Yeah, my folks were very, we were, and, and being for Stevenson in Texas, when there was like one other kid, a Jewish girl, Sylvia, somebody in my uh, elementary school that was for Stevenson in the whole school in Houston. Everybody else was, you know, for Ike or whatever the hell. And it's easy to be for Ike. He's the bottle of ketchup on the kitchen table. That's like saying you're a Jimmy Buffett fan. You know, that's it's not hard to do. I'm a Jimmy Buffett fan. But, but um, in fact, Jimmy and I, I believe, I always say there's a fine line between fiction and nonfiction, and Jimmy Buffett and I snorted it in 1973. But before activities of that kind in the 1970s, Kinky Friedman went to Asia, part of the Peace Corps created by President John F. Kennedy in 1961, an organization Kinky Friedman says inspired his generation. I mean, a generation of millions of young people, and I was one of them, traveling across the world to work for 11 cents an hour and love every minute of it and think that it was meaningful and important. And then when we come back, we realize it's the most important work we ever did in our lives. And with that experience in Asia, you know, there's so much going on in Asia now, the rise of China, uh, the development of India, a US president who says that he is refocusing uh, American foreign policy away from its traditional theaters in Europe and the Middle East and onto Asia. How do you view all that with that particular experience that you had there? Asia, I love Asia. I love their attitudes. Their attitude toward the elderly and old folks is so much more humane and Christian than ours is. And um, their idea of families is a beautiful thing. Um, so the whole East, uh, wherever it's not good, it's because of government. China's an example of that. The people are the best. The culture and the food are the best. Their attitudes are really different. Vietnam, too. Just a wonderful place. I mean, where the kids are so smart. And you can just see it in their eyes. And they, uh, and they love America. Uh, and not that our goal is to make people love us. If it is, then we've certainly dropped the ball. Still to come, Kinky Friedman assesses the state of the nation and its role in the world. Stay with us for more of Conversation With, U.S. Selection Special. Everything, they say, is bigger in the Lone Star state of Texas. That is certainly true of the skyscrapers, the highways, the cars, even the meals they serve in the steakhouses here. But it's also true of opinions. This has always been a part of the world where people aren't afraid to express themselves. And in that regard, Kinky Friedman, the Jewish cowboy, is 100% Texan. This is Winston Randolph Spencer Churchill Friedman. Who wants to be on television. Yeah, he does. He's kind of a... And probably has been on there before. Bit of a ham. Yeah, he has, but he, <laughs> he's young. He hasn't been on as, as many big shows and as many... Uh, well, we're very happy to have him. He likes you, Simon. We're, very, we're very, happy very happy to have him. It is no coincidence that Kinky Friedman has a dog named Winston Churchill. As we talked, the name of the British wartime leader was invoked repeatedly. He's the kind of statesman Kinky Friedman argues America needs today. Churchill, during the war, would stamp memos, inter-office memos, action this day, exclamation point. Well, let's not just pick on the Democrats, all these damn politicians. None of them know what action this day means, because they, they don't do it. Can you imagine somebody firing the most popular general in the world, Douglas MacArthur? I mean, Truman did that. And at the time, he was hated and reviled. I remember it. And uh, yet today, he, today, people look back and they say, you know, this is a guy who really uh, acted uh, right directly from his heart and his conscience. It's what he calls a moral clarity that he argues is missing from the White House today. So let me ask you about a moral issue that, that, that is on President Obama's desk, and that is, do you stand with Israel should it come to the point where Benjamin Netanyahu decides to take military action against Iran? You would unhesitatingly say, stand with Netanyahu. Well, of course you do. Um, around the early 50s, I remember a Texas congressman, uh, some politician coming back from Israel, the Holy Land. And he was at the airport in Houston. And, 
and he, he was told the press, he says, hell, he says, uh, them people ain't Jews, they're Texans, talking about the Israelis. And that's been the bond. We have kind of a John Wayne bond with Israel. And I think uh, the great irony here is that the people in the East, the Jews in the East, uh, many of them don't really uh, understand or relate to Israel, and they've got this bullshit about, oh, it's just Netanyahu or someone like that. It's just the government that we don't like or whatever. These are Jews. And it, down here, everybody understands Israel, I mean, instinctively. But what do you say to those people who say there could be another leader of Israel tomorrow that actually takes a different view of Iran? Um, I mean, how do you then devise an American policy that is more textured than simply saying, we've got to stand with the guy who's running Israel? Well, he's more than the guy who's, who's running Israel. I mean, uh, his whole life from his brother being killed, uh, uh, he's, he's the guy right now. I mean, if that were to change, um, I don't think it changes with the ex existential threat uh, that Iran poses, um, which has been handled exactly wrong. Um, you, can, you can just tell the, these people, and by these people, I mean the Middle East in general, I mean bullies anywhere, dictators anywhere, because every country in the Middle East has been run by dictators until the Arab Spring. Right now. They've all been run by dictators. Um, and they do not respond to Muslim outreach. They see that immediately as here's a guy we can take advantage of. Um, that's all they see it as weakness. So you're friends, I know, with George W. Bush. Yeah. Uh, when Barack Obama came into office, there was a widely held perception, not just in the United States, but internationally, that something had to change as far as America's standing in the rest of the world was concerned. Well, he did it, didn't he? He did a good Bush job. Yeah, well, all the polls now show that we're less popular than we were when Bush was president with the Arabs. Why are we trying to be popular with the Arabs? I mean, what's the point? Um, I mean, we have to do what's right, whatever, you know, whatever we think is right. There's, there's um, the, the only free Arabs that can vote, that could actually vote Netanyahu out of office, live in Israel. That's all. The rest of them can't vote. And, and uh, whatever you want to talk about YouTube videos and things like that, meanwhile, the Egyptians are killing Coptic Christians. They're killing them because of the Arab Spring. So he was very quick, Obama was very quick to throw uh, Mubarak under the bus. And uh, Mubarak may have been the best thing we had going. Uh, and he's a dictator too, but he's not quite of the caliber of a guy like Assad. So yeah, the Assad thing is ridiculous. I mean, we've we've clearly showed that we're not players. That's, we're not players. Nobody gives a damn what we think anyway. So the bad guys over there, they care about us. If they were to see this interview, they would be as unmoved by what I'm saying as they are by what Obama's saying. They just, it doesn't matter what we say now because they know that we don't believe in action this day or any day for that matter. Still to come, Kinky Friedman's personal political plans and his focus on saving the animals. Stay with us for more of Conversation With, U.S. Selection Special. If you've spent a lot of time watching American movies, then you probably think of Texas as a pretty conservative state. The kind of place where people wear 10-gallon hats, assess their manhood by the number of guns they own, and adopt a series of conservative positions in some of the country's biggest social debates. So you probably don't think of Texas as the kind of place where the governor could one day be a Jewish cowboy running for election as a Democrat. In which case, Kinky Friedman respectfully asks you to think again. Look, I'm 61 years old, too young for Medicare and too old for women to care. But I care about what's happened to Texas. He has tried to reach the top of the tree in Texas politics before. Kinky Friedman ran for election as an independent to become governor of the state six years ago. He lost but wants to try again, this time as a Democrat. His target, the incumbent governor Rick Perry, who himself tried to run for the presidency earlier this year until a disastrous debate performance in which he couldn't remember which government departments he planned to close once he reached the White House. I mean, people were so worried about me, about having a clown or, or a comedian in the governor's mansion, and now they realize we've had one for all these 12 years. His name is Rick Perry. 
who did not acquit himself well no. on the national stage when he sought the Republican well, nomination. Well, God punished him, that's all. For, uh, but, but when I die, I'm to be cremated, and my ashes are to be thrown in Rick Perry's hair. So we've got that set up, our last will and testament. Uh, <clears throat> he just isn't... Uh, uh, how should I say this? Is it, Things are just very strange down here in Texas right now. So it's a good time uh, for the Kingster. Um, and I think I would have a, might have a good shot. I think people are ready for a Harry Truman. They're ready for an old-fashioned Democrat. So now you alluded to this earlier about the difficulty inherent in potentially running for office when you're branded a comedian, a satirist, a musician. No, I'd have to be more serious. I mean, how, but you are you are serious about trying to do this. I mean, this is not this is not a pie in the sky notion for you. You want to do this. Well. I think the best governors we've had have always come from the outside, and the best politicians we have have come from, not from politics. One issue Kinky Friedman says he'll tackle if he's elected governor, the state's reputation as the death row capital of the United States. Death row, he says, is not filled with rich people. You know, the death penalty, we've got to get rid of that, I think. I believe that very strongly. And I often speak to Christian groups, and I tell them, you know, that I... Getting rid of the death penalty is one of the first things we need to do. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sorry that you have to hear, that, hear this from a Jew, but remember that's who you heard it from the first time. And uh, it is true that uh, a Christian should not support a death penalty. And if I can get the Christians to understand that, then we won't have a death penalty. That's a massive mountain to climb in this state, campaigning against the death penalty in a state where it's overwhelmingly supported in, in, the, in the, the death row capital of America? I think it's a place where we're going, definitely, where we're going to get rid of it. Um, we have the biggest death row probably in the country. I'm sure we do. And uh, you know what? We've never bothered to DNA this death row. And, and it's very cheap and easy to DNA a death row. Um, so with our massive prison population, we might, it's been estimated by the Innocence Project, we may be 5% wrong or 10% wrong. Well, that's huge. How driven are you by this quest for statewide office? If you were, as you put it, bugled to Jesus and you hadn't achieved it, would that be a disappointment to you? Um, deeply down, no, it wouldn't be. Uh, I've come to conclude that what a State Department guy in Pakistan sent me after I lost the governor's race is correct. Uh, he said, uh, he sent me a letter that said, uh, don't feel bad, the crowd always picks Barabbas. The crowd always says, kill Jesus, free Barabbas. And that's pretty much the way it's been down through history. We managed to elect the Rick Perrys. We'll, we'll pick the Obamas. And in truth, uh, John McCain might have been a very good president. We don't know. It, as Churchill points out, Sometimes it takes too long to get to the battlefield. Kinky Friedman expresses ongoing admiration for politicians who inspire people. And that's one of the reasons why he's so down on Barack Obama this presidential election season. Were the expectations surrounding Barack Obama when he got sworn into office uh, four years ago inevitably too high? Yeah, yeah, they were. Um, uh, you look at FDR and Churchill, you, you look at two pure blood aristocrats. I mean, you know FDR and Churchill playing polo in India as a young man, you know, and having a, an adult butterfly collection and things like that. I mean, these are, these are aristocrats. And yet they both really had, had a visceral connection with a common man. I always like a man of the people and I don't see that at all in Obama. And, uh, and, and now to quickly say that Romney is not a man of the people, that he's some rich white guy that doesn't get it, um, history has shown that that's not necessarily right. We don't know about Romney. We do know about Obama, though. So you don't necessarily, necessarily rule out the possibility that Romney could establish that visceral connection with the people. Yes, yeah, sure, it's possible. You, gotta, you, you don't know the guys that... Obama is our, our main evidence here, that you can have a guy who whips the world into a frenzy about his candidacy and then immediately proves that uh, he can't lead. That, he, that he's weak. Um, and that perceived weakness is just deadly. 
When he's not thinking about national politics or touring the world to promote his books and music, Kinky Friedman worries about the animals. In a rough scrabble patch of the Texas Hill Country, he's built the Utopia Rescue Mission, now home to dozens of animals saved from an untimely death. Talk to me about the Utopia Rescue Mission. Why is that important to you? Well, that's something I've always loved, is uh, animals. And um, Utopia, it's utopiarescue.com, anybody wants to check us out. And we're a never kill sanctuary. This is our 15th year. And we'll take any stray or abused animal. And if you visit us, you will see that Cousin Nancy and Tony, who run the place right across the river here, um, these are the happiest animals you'll ever see. It's a happy orphanage. Uh, we think we've opened the gates of heaven a little bit wider. We've adopted thousands of dogs over the past few, few 15 years. And we say that money may buy you a fine dog, but only love can make him wag his tail. You are 67 years old. Yeah. You're in the middle of this bipolar tour, which is taking you 25 shows in 26 days on the West Coast. Right. Another 25 shows in 26 days in Europe coming up. Yeah, I don't think we'll have quite that many in Australia. So we'll have a lot. But You're you're talking about possibly running for the, for the governor? No, it is 2014. We've got some time. Why do you want to work this hard? Well, I, I, I think if you're doing something that you enjoy and you have a, a, an ability to accomplish something, I, I, I don't think it's really work. Um, and I think, like Lucille Ball said, the busy people do everything, you know? The rest of us, just, we can't even get up in time to you know, make coffee or whatever it is that we do. Kinky Friedman has often been compared to the 19th century American satirist Mark Twain, the creator of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And like Twain, he is a certified American original. Whether he ever achieves his ambition of winning a statewide or even national elected office is almost beside the point. It's his contribution to the texture of American life that defines him. And he already calls himself the governor of the heart of Texas. I'm Simon Marks from San Antonio in Texas, goodbye.